how uh, SAP knows about uh, doing security testing in the company and how do they will develop a screen to act as uh, the security testers. Thank okay, you. floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So just a short background, SAP is a vendor of system software. It has over 60,000 employees, more than a third of uh, that are actually developers. So development software and development locations are distributed worldwide. The largest location is still in Germany, but we have big locations in China, in India, in, the, in Eastern Europe, in the US. So it's really a global company. And my, for myself, uh, I'm working on our security testing strategy for the software development. So how do we do security testing within the development? Uh, I also act as a researcher, and I'm working in the central security team that, for example, also designs our secure development, software development life cycle. Also as kind of a background, because I think it explains why we are doing things differently than other people. Uh, for example, we differ from the OWASP uh, SAMM model. We differ a little bit from Microsoft's proposal about the security development lifecycle. Uh, we have a rather decentralized development culture in our company. So we have a central security team or a team of central security experts. That's a rather uh, strong team defining the software security development lifecycle. It organizes the security trainings. Uh, it defines our product standards, so what are, so to speak, our OWASP top 10 equivalent. Uh, it defines risks, uh, risk assessment methods, threat modeling methods. Uh, it defines the security testing strategy. That's my part, for example, where I'm concentrating on. Uh, and it selects the security test products used within the company for the development area. Then in each development area, we have local security experts that then depends on how the local team organizes themselves, how many experts they have per developer, uh, if this is a full-time job or if there are several people doing, uh, so to speak, job sharing as a security expert. Uh, they support locally development teams in security activities. <coughs> and development teams themselves, they are rather empowered. <coughs> they can select whatever development technology they want to use in certain uh, boundaries but in principle they have much more freedom than in many other large companies. And they also select their local development models. So we have development teams which are already on a very cloud-based and agile development mo uh, model with uh, multiple release cycles per day. But we also have very traditional software development and we as a central team have to serve them all. Um, as motivation, why are we looking at software security at all? Uh, here for this audience, I think it's pretty clear this is the distribution of vulnerabilities over the last 15 years that were made public as CVE entries. And we see here the programming related uh, issues, so the non logical flaws like code injection, overflow issues, uh, SQL injection, process scripting are still on a pretty high uh, percentage of the overall CVE values. So we still have a problem in the industry of getting software systems secure from coding base. Let's look on an old study from software engineering that's from uh, Kasper Jones from, the 90, uh, from 1996, um, where software bugs actually occur, occur in the software development life cycle. And I don't want to argue about the numbers that are put on that graph. It's about the tendency. Uh, it's pretty obvious that most bugs and also most security related bugs are actually created when we code, when we implement the system. Fewer security problems are actually created by configuration issues when we deploy something. Most are definitely in the coding phase. On the other hand, if we look how much it costs to correct the bug, that's very cheap in the coding phase. So that's the red curve here. And very expensive when the software is already released and we need to patch and downfall cases. And if we look and as I said, that's already 20 years old here. When actually industry fixes defects, we see that most defects are fixed rather late in the software development life cycle. So it's stations where they are rather expensive. And that should not happen. That's why we have an intrinsic motivation to shift testing as early in the development life cycle as possible and start with testing when we also start with coding. <coughs> we heard already several, several talks today that a secure development life cycle or a security development life cycle is important. And one of the first ones that was published, I think it was actually the first one that was at least widely accepted, is the one from Microsoft. And that's also something we got a lot of inspiration from. It's a very good one, actually. 
We need to have training requirements, uh, training security in the requirements engineering phase. We need to do security design. Then the implementation phase is, of course, very important. That's where the bugs actually are created, where the security problems uh, really uh, occur. Then we have a verification phase, a release phase, and the response phase where we're handling bugs that happen uh, in the field when the software is deployed. Our software security lifecycle looks differently. And I will explain the differences after a few slides when I show what we're actually doing. Um, but here you see already it also looks like there's implementation and there's verification, two separate steps. And that looks like the model before. We first code, and then we look if the code is correct and start fixing bugs after we implemented it. And that's what we want to avoid. So actually, what are we doing, and how did we start? Um, we started with static analysis in 2010 globally. Uh, so since 2010, it's a mandatory technique for all products being developed at SAP. Regardless of the technology used, regardless of the shipment mode, if it's a cloud product or on-premise product, don't care. Uh, the static <coughs> application security test needs to be done for the product. And we are using various tools. Uh, I think all of the vendors are also here and have tools uh, besides our uh, internal tool for ABAP, which is an SAP proprietary language. Um, but you see already the tools work differently, have a different quality for the different programming languages, and therefore we use multiple of them. Um, and we constantly look at the usage and improve that. And that's a very good baseline because static analysis can be applied actually when I start to write the first line of code. So, looks good, problem solved, right? Sadly not. Static analysis cannot find all the bugs, all the security problems in our software, and also it does not work equally well for all types of vulnerabilities. So it clearly has advantages, but it also has limitations. It heavily depends on the programming languages being used. So for example, two, three years ago, when JavaScript was becoming more and more popular, we had big problems because none of the static code analysis tools delivered the quality we were happy with for JavaScript coding, so that was a big white spot in our uh, static, um, static code scan strategy at that point in time. And it usually only covers one layer of an application step, st uh, stack. So here on the right hand side, I have a very abstract architecture of a modern business application. We have a client, client application, rich client, for example, running on a web browser, which would then run again, of course, on the client side of an operating system. <coughs> we have the server application running in the container and we have some backend systems. And what we can cover very well with static analysis is one of those layers. So if we recall how we are using the tools currently, um, we most likely will use check marks for the JavaScript part running in the web browser on the client side. For the server application, for the Java part, we will use Spotify, and for the CC++ uh, part, Covarity. But there's still large areas uncovered. And none of the static tools really test the combination out of the application and the underlying web browser. So the security problem only occurs when I combine multiple of those layers, uh, multiple tiers of my multi tiered application, I usually will not find the static analysis. That's where dynamic tools are really good at. Like HP WebInspect or Dominator, which is a smaller tool dedicated for cross-site scripting um, modalities, they really run the application as it is in the whole environment. So I cover also the operating system, the network configuration, everything, and can really test through the whole stack. And of course, if I'm combining static and dynamic analysis, then I can also start to use the static tools more selectively. So for example, if I use Dominator for cross-site scripting and have HP Web Inspect running, there might be certain vulnerabilities found by check marks where I say, yeah, actually the dynamic tests have a better quality, so I don't look at those static findings. So I reduce my effort there, and maybe I say, yeah, the CC++ part is covered well by the dynamic tests, so for that product, I don't even use Fortify, so that the overall <coughs> effort then can be, uh, it's not that significantly higher compared to only using static analysis and I still cover a larger part of my application. Of course, there will always be areas that I do not cover. Um, that's just too much effort. <coughs> so the question is, 
how do I actually select those tools? How do I come up with a strategy for a specific product? Which combination of dynamic and static tools should I use? And for that, we are using a risk-based approach. We have our own risk assessment method called Securum, but the same principle applies if you're using, for example, OWASP uh, ASVS. So there are some differences in the uh, methods, but the principle uh, itself is uh, universal. From that risk assessment, we infer a prioritized list of SAP security requirements. SAP security requirements, that's our product standard security, that's a list of security requirements like SAP products shall be free of cross-site scripting, shall be free of SQL injection. So think about like the OBUS top 10 specialized for SAP products. And from the risk assessment, I also get a priority like for this specific product, SQL injection is a very high risk, cross-site scripting is a lower risk. For example, from implementing the server component, then most likely cross-site scripting is not very relevant. So it's also not very influencing on the selection of security testing tools. I also get the implementation details, like uh, which programming languages are used, which frameworks are used. So is this, for example, a server component using Node.js and Express that I will use different security testing tools compared to a Java application running on Tomcat. And also the application type. Is it a mobile application, a cloud application, client server application influences the selection of tools? And based on this information, we infer a product-specific security test plan, which then describes which security test techniques are used for the different components. And for example, this is a really only an illustrative example. That's not a real uh, uh, test plan. <coughs> uh, I have a very uh, simple application on the left-hand side. It's a small mobile application talking to a back-end server. And here, for example, I could assume that from the Risk assessment, the first risk I identified is that an attacker might inject JavaScript code into the mobile application. And then I see also from the implementation technique, we are using only UI5 controls. That's a, a programming guideline. UI5 is a framework developed by SAP. And luckily, that framework already has all kinds of uh, uh, um, checks for injection uh, in the fit and in the framework. So the programmer adheres to certain programming paradigms, they are already <coughs> secure. So that allows us to statically check the JavaScript part. Even so JavaScript is usually inherently hard to check statically because we can check for coding patterns and insecure usages of our own API. Um, for example, another risk I can see is that the SSL connections are not configured properly, that for example, invalid certificates are accepted by the solution. Um, that's usually something where static code analysis is not very good at. So here I come up with an additional manual test uh, doing dynamically checking that invalid certificates are not uh, accepted. And this test plan needs to be executed during development. And after development, I <clears throat> update this test plan into or convert the test plan into a test report. Um, documenting the results of the tests and also in many cases giving effort estimates so that we can improve uh, our own methodology and see where the actual effort is required. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes there are also cases that issues are not fixed. We are living with them because we say the risk is acceptable compared to the business risk of, of not shipping the software. That's what we already heard in one of the keynotes this morning. Um, the security department should not be the department that always says, no, we are not allowed to ship the software. Of course, if we do not ship software at all, the risk of security vulnerabilities is zero. But we also will not make any revenue, uh, which then impacts also our existence. So let's look at our security development life cycle that we came up with. And we also start with training. That's pretty obvious. Um, risk identification is also an important part. That's where the security requirements are also inferred together with a priority. Uh, then we have the planning of security. That this is, so to speak, the preparation phase. This is in a traditional software development lifecycle, the part where I'm designing the software. I do not yet start coding. 
when I start to plan the actual coding activities, I need also to plan the security measures. And the security testament I showed is one part of those security measures. So the development teams really need to accept that security costs effort in development and need to plan for that effort. Then we have the secure development, which includes, as the Microsoft uh, security development lifecycle, steady code scans and code reviews. But we also have a box there called security testing. And that's, for me personally, the big important difference here. We have security testing as part of development. It's not a separate activity. In addition, in the transition phase, which is the phase from the development team declares the product to be finished until it is shipped to the customer, uh, we have a security validation phase, which does an independent security assessment. That independent security assessment executes usually also additional security tests. I explain in a second in a little bit more detail. And then at the end, of course, the security response process for products being deployed at customer side, when we need to react and really on <coughs> found by external research, security researchers or our customers. So why don't we have testing and validation? What I explained beforehand are the security testing activities executed by our development teams in the development phase. Security validation is a central team, again, that acts as a first customer. It's not a replacement of the security testing during development. That's why I'm also opposing, again, we are developing, and at the end of the development, we are making a pen test. Security validation might make pen tests, or they're doing pen tests, but they are acting as a first customer. What is the security experience of a customer installing and using an SAP product? Validation checks actually mainly the implementation of our security development lifecycle and less the security of the product. In an ideal world, validation wouldn't find any flaws in the product because the development teams have the products developed securely and already tested thoroughly. Um, that's of course not true. There are still issues also in an ideal world that cannot be detected by development. So issues that are related to insecure configuration where you need really to install the whole system. In um, particular for large enterprise systems, this is a challenge. And not each and every development team is able to set up the whole product being developed if they are only developing parts of it. So this interplay between different components can only be tested by validation. And also documentation issues are the security guidelines documented properly is something that validation only can find. Note, there is a third kind of security tests that belong to a full secure software life cycle these are security tests, mainly then penetration tests done in the productive environment after installing an on-premise product productively or on cloud conf uh, configuration, so testing the actual cloud or hosting offering from a provider. That's again something different. That's also not replaced by validation. Neither it is replaced by security testing and development because these uh, uh, after development and after deployment security tests can then really test the actual productive configuration, including, for example, the network environment. <laughs> Is the firewall configured correctly? Here, I also might have installed a web application firewall, which is part of the uh, landscape that is tested. So there is at least three types of security testing uh, uh, techniques or areas for security testing in a security, uh, in a software development lifecycle. So we are doing a lot of activity. And of course, one of the questions is, how do we measure success? Measuring success for security activities in software development is always a difficult question. And in particular, for security testing and development, we came up with the following uh, considerations. We analyze regularly, actually on a monthly basis, because we have a monthly, monthly security patch day, uh, the vulnerabilities reported by security validation, as well as the vulnerabilities reported by external security researchers or customers. So what is actually found when software or software is used in the field? We analyze those issues, and in principle, there are two possible cases. First, the reported issue is of a nature that it cannot be detected by our tools. It is not detected by our current tool offering that we offer to development. The other option, of course, is it can be detected. 
Let's go in more detail to the first case, assuming this type of vulnerability that is not detected by our current offering and security testing tools. Again, there are in principle two options possible. It could be a vulnerability that can in principle be detected by the tools or techniques that we are currently offering to development. Then we need to improve the tools. Either it is a tool configuration, which we can do ourselves, or we need to approach the tool vendor and ask for additional features. So for example, uh, I think two or three years ago, uh, HTTP verb tampering was this kind of attack. The curve out of the blue, none of the static code analysis tools detected it, but it is a type of vulnerability which can in principle be detected statically, so we needed to improve the configuration and we had a, had a dedicated project for that. Uh, Logic the flaws, for example, so this took an example, I have an internet shopping application and I can go shopping without actually uh, paying the goods I'm shopping. That's something which can only be understood if I know what is the business purpose of the application. That will not be reported by none of the automatic static or dynamic tools. Um, there we need to come up with other uh, tools and methods how to find those issues. If the second case, so if there is a vulnerability reported that can be detected by our security testing tools, again we need to ask ourselves, why did it slip through the process? Where was the actual root cause that this vulnerability was in the ship software product? The first case is a rather easy one. Um, our software has really long maintenance cycles, 10, 20 years. So we have customers which are still working on software that was released 15 or 10 years ago. Where we didn't have these thorough security testing uh, techniques at night, so today this type of vulnerability wouldn't be shipped to customers. Okay, that's, uh, that's happening, uh, but hopefully the number of these kind of issues will reduce dramatically when customers upgrade their system. If it's a vulnerability in a, a rather recently released uh, software product that could be detected by our tools, we need to analyze why we missed that vulnerability. That could be that somebody misclassified the issue, thought, yeah, there's an issue, but it's low risk, and it's actually at this high risk. Uh, these kind of uh, mistakes, of course, uh, occur. We are all human, and human makes, make, uh, are making mistakes. Uh, but we need to analyze it and understand if we have a principal problem there or if it was just an accident. And we are doing this kind of analysis. And the actual uh, success criteria is that if we look at the number of vulnerabilities being reported in a fixed time frame, let's say within one month, the number of, or the percentage of the percentage of vulnerabilities that is not covered by our tools should increase over time. That means for the type of vulnerabilities that can be detected by our tools, the percentage should decrease. So for example, uh, the likelihood that tomorrow somebody finds a secret injection or a product should decrease over time dramatically because we are testing very good for SQL injections. And that's the type of success criteria we measure ourselves against. Um, simpler criteria like the number of reported issues, number of issues reported by external security researchers, is hard to judge because we do not have no control uh, over the activity of external security researchers and it could just be the case we have summer break, <coughs> everybody is lying on the beach, nobody is doing uh, external security research, so nothing is reported and in the long, long winter months when everybody is sitting at home we got more reports so that's not really something we can scientifically measure that we are getting better. What are the lessons learned from using this multiple stage security testing approach at SAP. The key success factor, of course, is a holistic security awareness program for developers, for managers, for everybody in the company. We heard that uh, all the we are hearing that always. Security awareness is the big problem. Developers don't understand security. We need to make them aware that security is an important topic. Yes, security awareness is important. But Developer awareness is even more important. The really hindering factor is the missing developer awareness by the security experts. And that's something which we really need to tackle. The key success factor is really listen to your developers. Understand 
Why they implement software not as secure as we would like them to implement them? Why are they making mistakes? I believe that there is no developer that wants to implement insecure software on purpose. They want to implement secure software. But it's so much more difficult to build something securely compared to finding an attack in the software. It's much easier to destroy a house compared to building one that is undestroyable. It's not just building an arbitrary house. We ask them to build an undestroyable house. Um, <clears throat> And you cannot expect your developers to become penetration testers or security experts. That's not their job. Their job is to build good, high-quality software. And high-quality means uh, reliable, but also secure. So we need security testing that is consumable by developers. So we need security testing tools for developers that need to be applicable right from the start in development that automate the security knowledge that doesn't need to mean that they need to be fully automated tools, but most of the security assessment needs to be automated. A developer has usually not a big problem in executing a security te a test tool. They are doing it anyhow for functional tests. They are running JUnit tests. Uh, they are also willing to do some interactive tests. No problem with that. But if they need to understand what is process scripting, how do I check, to modify HTTP headers to use a test tool, that's most likely not the right test tool for a developer because it requires additional security knowledge. And that security knowledge needs to be encapsulated in the tools. And we need to make them consumable, easy to consume. They should be so easy to consume that it feels morally wrong not to use them. Build them in the IDE, instant feedback, for simple things like hard-coded password or using insecure APIs like Java, Util, Random. Uh, I mean, just when I type that call, it should be underlined like doing a spelling mistake in Word. Tell the people directly, immediately, it's not a good idea to use an insecure random generator. There is a good alternative. It has the same API. You just need to replace an import statement at the beginning of your Java code. And we also need tools that nicely integrate into continuous uh, integration environments like Jenkins. They can do more in-depth analysis because they don't need to provide instant feedback, but they also need to provide feedback within eight hours or so that an overnight uh, check is possible. And we need to provide easy to understand fixed recommendations. We've seen in one of the keynotes today these nice explanations from Stack Overflow and other websites how things can be done securely, how things can be encrypted using Base64 and stuff like that. You don't want your developer to find these kind of solutions in the internet, so we need to provide them with easy to understand and clear recommendations what to do. And also we need to declare clearly what are the sweet spots of the tools. Sometimes tool vendors or also we as a security ex experts claim that a security testing tool can find all SQL injections. That's usually not true. They have their sweet spots. They work for certain frameworks, certain architectures. The tools work very well. For others, they don't work well. Make this transparent so that people can select those tools that work well on the products they are developing, or that they are aware that they're developing in a space where we cannot offer good automated tools, and that they need to do manual code review, integrate pen tests, more pen tests, because they cannot rely on these automated tools. And finally, uh, collaborate with your developers. We as security experts need to collaborate with development. We need to create more easy to use APIs. Who has ever tried to use an SSL API securely? It's a tremendously hard task. And we are seeing more and more reports that none of the mobile application is validating certificates. Whoever tried to implement the uh, uh, certificate validation on N5 in the test environment, where I need to disable all the checking so that I can use outside certificates, and then switch to a production environment, understands how easy it is to forget to enable the validation again. We need to think about solutions that makes it much more easier to test and develop secure uh, security features of our software in a test environment. 
and to design APIs that makes it the secure usage of the API, the default, make it hard to implement something insecure. The default needs to be the secure API. And we also need to help the people that design programming languages and frameworks to do the same. It should be hard to implement insecure systems. And we need, of course, to explain how to program securely. For a programmer, yes, it's nice to understand how an attack works. It's nice to understand what cross-site scripting is. But an explanation of cross-site scripting is, is helpful for people that are interested in security already. If I'm a developer who only says, yeah, the system should be secure, I don't need to be able to distinguish cross-site scripting, stored cross uh, reflective cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting. There's a problem. The security export says it needs to be fixed, or I should not implement this problem. So please help me how to do it right, even if I don't understand the details what cross-site scripting is. Just help me to avoid it. That's what we need to uh, do for our developers. And yeah, conclusion, before we come to the question and answer session, software secure software development is a prerequisite also for um, secure operation. So if you're not doing on-premise software development but cloud development, uh, even with fast release cycles and it's much easier to patch your software, you need to develop your software securely. And the soft these abstract security software development lifecycle I've shown, we also apply them to an HR development framework uh, where we have a, just a slightly different process, representation of it to making this fast development <coughs> cycles more visible in the representation. But it's the same steps in there, the uh, same tasks that need to be done. Uh, secure software development is also an important uh, mitigation strategy for the risk of operating and maintaining IT systems in general. We need to have an end-to-end -end approach for security, starting by training developers doing security testing during development, the validation of the actions that we are doing in the final pro uh, pro um, product, as well as doing maintenance and security patch management. <coughs> and again, I cannot say uh, uh, enough. The developers are not your enemies. Developers are the most important ally with respect to implementing secure systems. So we should make life easy for them. Uh, that's really the important part. Thank you. Uh, I'm now happy for discussing the topic, answering questions. Let's start. I must ask to give you the microphone. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that you, the way you've set it up. I was just wondering how much, um, how much did you align your tools with the tools developers are already known and work with? Things like, like automated building and, and automated testing frameworks that are already there. Um, we are aligning that, so for example, we are working on, uh, we have an enterprise GitHub license within our company, so we are integrating uh, the testing tools into GitHub, so that if you create a project on the GitHub server, the project is automatically also uh, created on uh, the management servers for the security testing tools. Um, there's still a lot of improvement uh, possible, but we are working to make it as easy as possible to integrate that and um, we are also developing small security testing tools that are integrated into the IDE that give instance feedback to the developers that are not necessarily on the type of quality that you can do for uh, a final security assessment of the product but it helps already to avoid a lot of smaller mistakes right from the beginning. Um, this is not a question, it's more of a comment. Um, from my experience, it is fundamentally important to also say from time to time what the developers do right. So to emphasize what they have done well, because this, first, they, they know next time how to do it well again. And second, you kind of, you know, you make the relationship to your developers better. So I, as a penetration tester and someone who has to tell them or pick on them and tell them what they or how they have to could do stuff better, 
in my experience, it's very important to tell them that there is things that they have done well, actually. Yes. Just a comment, no question. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with this. And I had a question about two, two aspects of this. For, forgive me if I missed it at the beginning. I came in a bit late. I'm trying to do the same thing in a large global footprint of developers. And um, I'm wondering how you handle the scale of global footprint of developers in terms of education and tool maturity usage. Uh, and then my second question is also, SDL is great and SSDL is great for new developments. But what about legacy? What's an RD production? How do you catch that? Thanks for the great talk. Uh, would you say um, that it makes sense uh, to implement security tests as unit tests? And if so, should that be done by the developers? Can they do that? Or should that rather be done by the security experts? somebody volunteers to be the security expert uh, in comparison to somebody that was elected to be the security expert. Thank you for, for your talk. Um, I have one question. Uh, if you had to build this team right now, the security team, what skills would you be looking for exactly in these people? Um, the central team which selects the tools, um, that's an interesting 
combination, you need to have the technical skills and understanding how the tools work, to what extent they can be improved, uh, which is also important in your relationship to the vendors of those tools, but you also need the process experts that can define the overall processes, so you need uh, really uh, various skill sets there so that well, it makes sense to have really a number of people working in that area. Um, it is security expertise uh, firsthand, but also a solid understanding how development works. So in particular for the security testing part, I prefer people that did software development for some time on their own. That they know the development tools, that they know or at least can feel the pain a developer has in using testing tools that don't give good recommendations how to fix something. Thank you. Um, you said that you have teams that are um, agile and, and extreme, but you also have uh, classic waterfall. In your experience, um, do you see uh, more problems in agile or, or not? Who is uh, handling the static code analysis results? Who's processing or looking at them and decides if it's indeed an issue and should be picked up by the development teams? That's the task of the local security experts. And then it depends on the local teams. I know that we have teams where really within this current team there is one security expert looking at all of the results and the developers only have that security expert, so to speak, as an interface to the analysis tools, they just get reports in the whatever bug tracking system they use. Uh, and I also know that we have teams where each and every developer is able to execute scans and look at the results. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have numbers which of the models works better from an objective point of view. Personally, I prefer when developers have direct access to the tools. Um, because uh, anything that is fixed before a security expert or somebody that could be understood as a, as a kind of controlling part of the process sees it, the better. I mean, I always come up with the explanation, if I program in Java and I forget a semicolon at the end of the line, the compiler reminds me to put it there, I put it there, fine. If the security testing tool finds issue, I fix them immediately. I don't discuss, need, does this need to be fixed or not, I do it. I, from a security expert, I don't want to have a statistics of that. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I need to do a scan at the end to assess the quality, but if the developer in the meantime did hundreds of scans or none, that shouldn't be an issue. So if the developer wants to have access to it, he, should, he or she should have. Okay, and then you, you assume that there are no lot of, uh, a lot of false positives, so that somebody marks that's not exploitable because he lacks security knowledge? Or I mean, that's something which we then would capture in our validation phase and then we need we see that we need to re-educate people doing the assessments. Other questions? Time for one more, I think. Thanks for the talk. I find the bit about the organizational design very interesting. Is there any crossover between the people who are security experts on the teams and the people who carry out the um, assessments at the end? Uh, no, the, um, the validation team is uh, by design a separate team which is not part of the development uh, teams at all. Um, they are also uh, free to use whatever assessment method they like to do. That's really like uh, in the European uh, political system that the people designing the laws and controlling that people comply to them are separate. Okay, I think we uh, can wrap up. Thanks a lot for the talk. Please uh, don't forget people.